Hi everyone, my name is Susie Kim and I'm a national reporter for NBC News um, based in Washington, D.C. And I'm here just to talk about our uh, investigation that we did into carbon monoxide hazards in public housing. So uh, basically the impetus for this investigation was the death of two men in a South Carolina public housing complex um, who died in January 2019, January of this year, from carbon monoxide poisoning. And what we found was basically that, that HUD, uh, which is the Hous Department of Housing and Urban Development, does not actually require carbon monoxide detectors in any public housing. There were no carbon monoxide detectors in the apartments where these two men lived. Um, and in fact, there were none in any of the other apartments where hundreds of other families lived. So all of the families were forced to evacuate this public housing complex um, in Columbia, South Carolina in January. Um, they were not allowed to return home because it was too dangerous for them. Um, so they all had to find new homes. And uh, in fact, HUD does not require detectors in homes where more than 4.6 million families live. Um, and these families are some of the most vulnerable folks uh, in the country. They're low income. Many of them are elderly. A lot of them are families with young children. These are populations that are particularly vulnerable to carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and moreover, they live in housing that is oftentimes not in the best condition. Um, reserves, um, reserve funding to do repairs, basic maintenance, things like that for public housing um, has been cut over many years. Um, and so some of these properties um, are not in great shape and that makes it even more uh, potentially dangerous for them to live in. Um, so uh, basically over the course of this investigation, we discovered that um, no one actually keeps track of these deaths in public housing from carbon monoxide poisoning. HUD doesn't, the local housing authorities don't, um, we couldn't find any researchers or academic researchers who do. So we started to put together our own um, death toll of uh, carbon monoxide deaths just to show um, the fact that, that this has happened before. Um, and what we found was by the end of our investigation, um, at least 13 people have died from carbon monoxide poisoning in public housing, in federally assisted housing since 2003. And uh, that those are just the deaths that we could confirm through public records, through uh, news reports, through calling coroner's offices and so forth. Um, and so HUD has known uh, that this has been an issue for many years and yet um, did decided that it wasn't going to require detectors and it wasn't going to take action. And, and the only action we've really seen is um, since our investigation first published. Um, so uh, since the part one published on, on March 1st, um, and in the uh, months since then, uh, there have been bills introduced in Congress in both the House and Senate to require detectors. And HUD has finally um, made its own promise that is going to require detectors and has put forward uh, $5 million in emergency funding um, to actually uh, have funding available for landlords um, who run public housing to to purchase them um, if they can't uh, afford them. So, uh, you know, we've seen a really big and immediate impact of uh, the work that we've done. Um, and I would love to answer any questions that you guys have about our investigation, about HUD, um, or the state of public housing in the U.S. Um, you can put your questions right in the comments on here on the Facebook page. HUD has not given a timeline. Uh, this is something I've asked them repeatedly. So HUD promised um, uh, after our first investigation published that it actually would be going through what's called a rulemaking process. So this is a formal process that takes many different steps. Um, it can take months or sometimes even years for the formal rulemaking process um, to be completed. This is what you need to um, publish a new rule or have a new uh, regulation in place. Um, so HUD has promises that it's working on this, but actually um, has not even put out its first proposal, which is the first step um, in terms of doing uh, and requiring something like this. Um, and HUD has actually said that it can, uh, it can only move faster if Congress actually passes one of the bills 
that has been introduced or, or comes up with a new bill. Um, and so far, Congress has not actually moved forward. Um, you know, I think lawmakers there are are hopeful that um, that 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 they'll be moving on this, since there seems to be a pretty broad consensus that this is a problem and this this shouldn't happen, and the solution is relatively affordable. Um, but so far, we are still uh, waiting. Um, and the thing that advocates, uh, housing advocates, and other folks worry about is that um, this might just drag on for months and months, and that more people might end up dying um, before this becomes a requirement that is actually enforced by HUD. So basically, the, the responsibility will be, um, so the question is, um, will HUD be responsible for purchasing the detectors or will residents of housing have to purchase the detectors? Uh, so it's the landlord's responsibilities. There are public uh, landlords for public housing that um, those are local housing authorities um, that own and run uh, public uh, traditional public housing. And there are also private landlords um, who receive rental subsidies from HUD, who have a contract with HUD. So the um, basically it will be there, the owners and the landlord's responsibilities to purchase and install the direct detectors and make sure they're working properly. And if they aren't installed and they aren't working properly, um, HUD will be able to take enforcement action against them uh, if they don't fix the problem. They would get points off in inspection and HUD has a variety of tools um, to make sure that these properties are safe um, as they are mandated to do under federal law. So states, so um, the question is whether states have carbon monoxide requirements. Actually, so over the years, a growing number of states, either through uh, regulation or through a law that's passed the state houses and the governor's um, um, mansions. So various states have carbon monoxide detector requirements, but there are a lot of different variations. A lot of them have exceptions or loopholes or they're just restricted to a certain kind of housing. Um, for, for example, some states only require them for new construction or newly renovated properties, um, not for older properties. Um, so there are different requirements. And basically, if a state law or a local law requires it, um, HUD says, you know, already that they have to abide by those. The public housing has to abide by those rules. But um, the other thing that we found is that even when these uh, detectors are required by state or local law, um, you know, those laws aren't always enforced. There are limited resources, um, there are limited inspections, there's not always someone to follow up. Whereas with federal public housing, there are required, there are man mandatory inspections. These have to happen every couple of years. And if HUD does make this a requirement, it will be their inspectors will have to follow up and see whether those detectors are actually there where they need to be. This has been going on for a long time. Um, and this is not, the question is whether this is new to this administration. Um, so in the deaths that we looked at, and we just looked at um, a time period, you know, of about 16 years, since 2003, um, deaths have occurred uh, at pretty regular intervals, uh, 2003, 2004, 2012. Um, so the Obama administration knew about this, the George W. Bush administration had deaths happen. Um, this is not any one administration's fault. Uh, that said, um, you know, some of these deaths um, did catch more attention than others. Um, there were deaths in 2012 that happened, um, I think an elderly couple who died in, in housing there and the local congressmen spoke out about it, but no change happened on the federal level um, at HUD or Congress didn't propose anything new. I um, mean, I think part of the problem is uh, that public housing, even when it's federally subsidized and there are federal requirements and federal taxpayer money going in, it isn't always seen as being connected to Washington, connected to the federal government. Um, it's a really decentralized uh, system in terms of in terms of how rental housing works, and people don't always connect the dots back to Washington. And in fact, it took us, um, where there's an incident where two people, two grandparents died in uh, outside of Detroit, Michigan, uh, just this February. It took us, um, you know, weeks of digging through all kinds of papers and leasing documents and things like that because it was a privately owned property. Um, and it's much harder to determine uh, if it's HUD subsidized and which residents live there. Not all the residents who live on a privately um, owned property receive rental subsidies. So there's a lot of um, kind of bureaucratic 
layers that kind of obscure the federal government's role. Um, and that's why we felt so strongly about this investigation and, and, and holding the people in Washington accountable as well. I mean, obviously, you know, the landlords, the private and public landlords are responsible for maintaining the property. It's not to let them off the hook, but it's also to show that the federal government has a role mandated by law in overseeing these properties and making sure the families who live there are in fact safe um, and safe to breathe the air there, safe to go to sleep. You know, the very basic things that, um, you know, I think there is a consensus that there should be a minimum standard and um, many people believe it should be higher than what it is right now. So what is interesting is that HUD um, says that, you know, it, it was aware of some of the, so four, so the four of the deaths that we found happened, just four of them have happened since the beginning of 2019. After the first incident, you know, basically HUD said, this is a tragedy uh, and we will we will make sure to to consider this issue. I mean, they were basically very vague and noncommittal in terms of what it promised to do, you know, because I asked I asked them directly, are you going to require carbon monoxide detectors and what are you going to do to prevent these deaths? And they basically just kind of put the question off. They said, we're we're looking at this issue. We'll get back to you later. And by the time um, our second investigation published um, with two more deaths, um, HUD's tone changed very much. In fact, HUD Secretary Ben Carson appeared before Congress uh, just recently, and he basically said that, that it was wrong. It is wrong that the federal government did not require detectors and that people lives were put at risk. Um, and that was a really big omission from Carson. Um, and it came right after HUD promised $5 million in emergency funding for detectors, which is something that um, advocates had been pushing them on um, ever since the first death this year came out. Um, so we're really seeing that greater public attention and these uh, in our investigation has has had an impact on, on policy and has had an impact both on HUD and on Congress, which is currently trying to, um, there are legislators who are currently trying to pass legislation to provide more funding and to make sure this is a requirement that, um, you know, that, that is in law and, and that that doesn't change. So the question is whether they've been lawsuits um, from families. So many of the families have filed lawsuits, uh, but they've been, for the most part, specifically directed against the landlords um, who are responsible. They're landlords and I would say the property management companies. Um, so the owners of the properties and the people who are responsible for maintaining them, making repairs, that kind of thing. So far, no one has, uh, to my knowledge, um, taken, at least none of the families that we've looked at, the deaths that we've looked at, have taken action against HUD. Um, I've Some lawyers I've spoken to for these, these families have, have raised that question. Um, uh, but again, I, I think part of the reason that, that no one has sued HUD is because HUD was not seen as being part of this. Um, and, and they were not seeing as having this oversight responsibility, which they do have under federal law. Um, so, you know, we, uh, so, so far there, there has been some legal action. There have been some settlements. Um, there, in fact, there was a, a jury who, um, decided in, in one of the cases, uh, I believe in Pennsylvania, um, to award, you know, a, a settlement to, to the family of, of one of the victims. But again, that, that lawsuit was focused on, on the housing authority and not on HUD. Uh, the housing authority is the local, um, agency, uh, basically responsible for running these properties. Yes, yeah, so the question is whether there are safety inspections of federal public housing at all. So under federal law, um, every federally assisted property has to undergo regular health and safety inspections. So there's a very long checklist of things that inspectors are supposed to go around, federal inspectors or uh, federal contractors who are working for HUD, go around and check off and basically grade these properties. Um, so it's everything from, you know, are there smoke detectors? Are they working? Are there broken windows? Um, are, are doors blocked? Um, so, and and there's a numerical score that, that comes out as a result. And if a property fails inspection, it has a uh, sort of window of time to fix those problems. Otherwise, there'll be enforcement consequences from HUD uh, if they don't pass inspection. Um, but as I found, in, and actually a previous investigation, one that I did last year on HUD, is that inspection system itself is is not always working great. Um, the scores don't always reflect 
how well, uh, what the condition of the properties. So properties that get passing scores, uh, in fact, can be in terrible condition, in really dangerous conditions, um, as I found. And properties that fail inspection sometimes um, can actually fail for for reasons that um, some people don't think are are that great. You know that that there might be a couple of external problems, but um, really they, they they didn't pass inspection for good reasons. So HUD has promised, um, after a lot of focus on the problems with the inspection process, on actually revamping the whole thing. So they're currently in the process of that right now, of making sure the federal self and health and safety inspections actually work better. But that's going to be a much longer process. Um, I think that's going to take a lot longer to see those changes implemented. Um, but but HUD plays a very important role in terms of making sure that these mon these properties they get federal taxpayer money are actually safe and healthy for the residents to live in. Okay. Well, thanks so much for. Um, all of your guys' questions. Um, there'll be links, uh, there's links on the top of this page, and I think that um, my colleagues are gonna embed here if you wanna look at any of the other stories in this series. Um, and uh, we'll continue to be following this issue and, and a lot more on NBCNews.com. Um, thanks again so much, and um, it was really a pleasure to, to be able to answer some of your questions about this uh, really important issue.